The fasting mimicking diet is supposed to mimic a fast, supposed to be able to give you all the benefits of a fast while still eating food. I'm not doing this video to rip anyone apart. That's not my goal, not my intention. I wanna make this unbiased because I feel like the fasting mimicking diet makes a lot of sense and it's rooted with quite a bit of credibility. It's created by Dr. Walter Longo who has a good reputation at USC in the longevity department. So I don't think that he created this off a total whim. I think he put a lot of research into this and he saw an opportunity to monetize it and that's kind of rare in the research world and the scientist world because they're not usually business-minded people. So I commend him for that. He created something that has some pretty good evidence with it. But let's break it down because I come from a slightly different school of thought with fasting than he does. And it's probably because we just come at it from different angles. So let's just break down what the fasting mimicking diet's all about. See, the idea is to put you into a calorically deprived state that's going to mimic fasting, but without forcing you to starve yourself. So essentially you're eating specific foods that don't activate uh, eating pathways, in, for lack of a better term. Like they don't make your body think that you're really consuming these specific nutrients that would activate growth signaling and things like that. What does that mean? Well, normally when we eat food, we have an activation of what is called mTOR which stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. Now mTOR is what I call the anabolic switch. Now mTOR is turned on when we eat protein, when we work out, whenever we are activating pro-growth signaling. It's not like mTOR is inherently bad. And the fasting mimicking diet isn't designed to be done all the time. It's designed to be done in five day spurts. It's designed to just kind of reset. So it's not anti-mTOR, it's just pumping the brakes a little bit, but I digress. So mTOR, when you eat something, you activate this anabolic switch. Well, the thing with mTOR is it's very black and white. It's not really dose dependent. Like you don't say, I'm gonna activate a little bit of mTOR. No, it's either all or nothing. So when you eat something, mTOR is activated, specifically protein. It's a lot more sensitive to protein. So the idea behind the fasting mimicking diet was, well, let's consume foods that do not activate mTOR as much. And let's eat foods that do not activate the IGF receptors or do not activate IGF-1 pathways, should I say. Uh, and they do, do this through an interesting pathway, which we'll talk about in just a second. Dr. Walter Longo's theory was, let's get the benefits of fasting without the stress on the body. Let's activate some of these rejuvenation pathways, regeneration pathways, stem cell pathways, and let's get there without the stress. And I commend him for that because it is potentially possible. I come at it from a slightly different perspective in the sense that I like the stress. I feel like pushing your body with these hormetic stressors and pushing it as far as you can and then allowing yourself to recover is what builds resiliency and what builds strength and what builds mental character. But I don't think that's what he's after. He was after the rejuvenation and the stem cell piece. So we're gonna dive into that for a second. See, his goal was to take what you would get out of a 48 hour fast, which is some autophagy, some ketosis, some IGF suppression, and wrap it up into a five day process where you consume about a thousand calories on day one and about 725 calories for the remaining four days in a very low protein, very low carbohydrate, moderately high fat protocol. Now the main avenue that he's going down is stopping the pro-growth signaling from IGF. So when you are in a fasted state, you have an increase in this uh, binding protein. It's called IGF binding protein or insulin growth like factor binding protein. And that encodes a further protein that basically makes it so that the IGF-1 pathway, which is a growth pathway, gets turned off. And that makes sense because you're not consuming anything during a fast, right? So there's specific foods that you can eat that will make it so that you don't really activate the IGF pathway. But what Volter doesn't really talk about in the marketing material is that really all they're doing is limiting protein because protein is going to be very strong with IGF signaling. So by limiting protein, you're kind of limiting the IGF signaling. Now, additionally, what's going on is he's putting you in a state of ketosis. So you have a lot of cellular benefits that come from ketosis. You have histone deacetylase inhibition, which you have all this different signaling that's occurring. You have autophagy that's occurring because you're still, for lack of a better term, in a state of starvation because it's a shock to your system because not you're, having, you're not having the carbohydrates, right? But because the protein's low and because the fat's still high, 
you're generating ketones and you're getting a lot of the benefit of a fast. So in essence, it's kind of just a low protein keto diet for five days, but there's some additional things that they add into it. So when you downregulate IGF-1, you're also going to downregulate glucose signaling as well, which can have a lot of beneficial effects on the cells. It kind of forces them to become more insulin sensitive and a lot of other things. This in turn can promote some stem cell renewal. This is cool because with stem cell renewal, then you're getting new growth potentially. And this makes sense. You can achieve some of the stem cell benefits while not being in a completely calorically deprived state. So that makes sense. Let's take a look at what you actually eat with this kind of protocol, the fasting mimicking diet. Okay, if you're gonna try it, if you consume black tea or green tea, you're totally good to go. I've messed around with fasting mimicking diet to kind of see how I feel with it. And it's not much of a departure from my typical keto diet. I'm just reducing the protein and I'm focusing a little bit more plant-based if I'm doing it. Uh, green tea is totally good to go. The green tea I would recommend, well, regardless, whether you're doing keto or fasting mimicking or fasting in general, is Ujido Matcha. Ujido Matcha is, uh, there's a link down below. It's a 180 year old Japanese matcha company. Yes, this is a product plug, but I use them all the time and they are my absolute go-to matcha green tea. So there's a special link down below in the description if you're looking for true authentic matcha that is grown in Japan, that is grown the right way, in the shade, baby green tea leaves, finely ground, processed and harvested naturally the way that it should be, then that's going to be the matcha for you. So keto fasting, fasting mimicking, whatever, that's what I would recommend. And there's a link down below, special link for viewers of this video. So you have your black tea, you have your green tea, and then uh, in his food packet that he's created, so he's created a marketing machine out of this, which is great for him. Um, he's got like a nut bar in there, which has macadamia nut uh, butter. This macadamia nut butter, definitely going to be lowish protein. It's going to be high in the palmitoleic acid, the omega-7s, uh, and the fats that are going to potentially help drive some of these mechanisms he's looking at. Uh, it has some honey in it, and the honey is kind of what throws me off. There's a good amount of fructose coming through from this whole thing, which, in my opinion, completely turns off some of the autophagic fluxes that we're trying to get a benefit from here, so I don't really understand that part. Also has some almond meal, which I wouldn't really have put into a nut bar simply because of the phytic acid content. If you're using macadamia nuts, then why do you need to have almonds in there unless it's just a profit margin kind of thing? So again, I'm a business-minded guy. Like, absolutely, you watch my channel, you know that I know how to monetize a channel and how to monetize something. It's no surprise to anybody, but like, at least kind of, I don't know, there's some weird things there. Then he's got some algal oil in there, which I'm a huge fan of. I think that's a great fleet great piece. You're getting the omega-3s in that are gonna have that nuclear factor kappa B suppression, have the big effects on inflammatory markers, have big effects on docosahexaenoic acid levels in your body that get into your brain and all coming from a uh, plant source, from an algae source. So huge benefit there. He's got some soup blends, which are a little bit odd. Uh, a dark chocolate crisp bar, which doesn't have sugar, but it's got dark chocolate, which is going to be a strong uh, autophagy driver. If you've seen my videos before, I talk about different foods that can stimulate autophagy, because autophagy is the cellular recycling that occurs within a fast, right? So when you're fasting, you have, um, how do I put this, your cells go through a survival of the fittest mechanism where they break down different components of themselves for fuel. And they do this because they say, oh, this is a weak component, let's eat it and use it for fuel. And then everything kind of builds back stronger, survival of the fittest. Well, autophagy doesn't just happen when you're in a calorie deprived or fasting state. There's specific foods that you can eat that can induce autophagy because autophagy is always occurring within your body. It's always an ebb and a flow. mTOR, autophagy happening here, happening there, happening different places of the body, right? So. Chocolate is one of those that can induce autophagy. Green tea is one of those that can induce autophagy. There's a number of these foods that do. Coffee can induce autophagy. Uh, then he's got some kale crackers in there, which I think is just kind of a snack thing, just a low calorie keto thing. He's got olives in there, which I think are a powerful thing, good fat source snack and hydroxytyrosol. So a big benefit there. And then he's got something, he's got his glycerol drink, which I find fascinating. Now this is a heavily marketed part of his whole brand and his whole protocol. This glycerol drink is supposed to help drive up energy metabolism via like gluconeogenesis. So when you're in ketosis, your body is utilizing different fuel substrates and it's using fats as a fuel source and you're left with what is called a glycerol backbone. So the fats get mobilized out of your tissue 
and they get broken off of this glycerol backbone. So imagine three fatty acids glued to a backbone. Okay, the fats come off of the backbone and you're left with a glycerol backbone. That glycerol backbone gets metabolized by the liver into a fuel, which triggers quite an interesting AMPK process, which kind of senses your body to be in a deficit. So it's kind of a trick. You're tricking your body to be in a deficit. So by consuming glycerol, you're kind of artificially triggering that AMPK pathway. At least that's my theory. He doesn't come right out and say that, but my research on gluconeogenesis and that AMPK phosphorylation, that makes sense. And that's why the glycerol there. So let's get to some results though. He's had some tremendous results with people, but I also think that a low protein, temporary plant-based keto diet would get a lot of people results, even if it didn't have Walter Longo's name attached to it. In mice, they've seen a reduction in cancer. They've seen a prevention of bone loss. They've seen neurogenesis where they're building new neurons. They've seen the remyelination of neurons, like where the actual sheath that surrounds a ner nerve is improving. And then of course, they've seen stem cell regeneration. So they've seen a lot of beneficial things. And then he's done his own human clinical, but I'm going to leave that one out of the equation because I feel like that is very biased. Uh, not that it's a bad thing. I feel it's impressive that he did his own study. I just want to leave it out of this video because I kind of want to take external pieces a little bit. So at the end of the day, I've done it. I've tried it. I didn't really have weight to lose. Frankly, I felt good, but it was really just a modified vegan keto that was low protein. I felt like I lost strength, but I don't think gaining strength is a particular reason that people would go on this protocol. It's kind of a refresh if you want to call it that. And if it's something that you want to do five days every quarter, I think that you could do it. You could probably look up specifically how to do it online without buying all of his stuff. But if you like his research, then support him because he's making a living doing this and he does put out a lot of good information as well. So anyhow, that's my recap of the fasting mimicking diet. Does it work? Yeah. Is it fasting? Absolutely not. But that's the point. I'll see you tomorrow.